So John, just, you know, we've, uh, you know, I've known of you and your organization in the space and whatever, but um, we'll talk about your org here in a second. I want to know about you, man. Like, the, yeah, the road to get here and right. who John Pano is and, and that, uh, that, you know, it's just interesting the paths that we all take to get to where we are. People see us at the end spot, but I'm curious, you know, how, how'd you get to where you are today? Your baseball career taken back through high school and up to this point. Yeah, so in, in high school, uh, I had the uh, the pleasure of being coached by Rich Emmert. Um, you know, he had been a college coach before and and was deciding to settle down. Uh, he had you know three daughters, and so he moved out of Orange County into Temecula and uh, took over the program uh, at Temecula Valley High School. And so, you know, we got to reap the benefits of years and years of experience and incredible baseball knowledge. Uh, and he brought in uh, Mike Spears, who was fresh out of college as a hitting coach. And uh, so just being around those two guys, uh, you know, as a 15, 16, you know, 17 year old kid, I got to absorb, you know, quite a bit, you know, and Mike would, you know, sneak us into uh, semi pro games in high school, you know, back in the day. And uh, so we got to, to do a lot and see a lot. And uh uh, after high school, uh, I went to junior college, uh, played a couple years there, uh, took a deal to Chapman and through a coaching change, I had all my stuff in the back of my truck and uh, I was ready to move in. And through a coaching change, I found out that, you know, I was no longer uh, rostered or part of that. Cause, I mean, <laughs> those darn then, coaches, man. Those darn yeah, coaches, I mean, back then know. we didn't have, you know, we didn't have Twitter and we didn't have the, the internet and stuff and nothing was ever published in, in newspapers. Um, and so I was like, okay, so I just, you know, turned the truck around and, and went back home and, uh, started coaching. Um, and the, the first, uh, like American Legion team, I think that I coached, I had, uh, like Reed Johnson, uh, was on that team. And so it was just some crazy talent, uh, that I've been able to kind of rub shoulders with and, and be around, especially as a, as a, as a young coach. Um, yeah. So, so, how, so how old, how old would that would have put you right about what then? Uh, I was right coaching. about 2021, right about 2021. Um, and, you know, I wanted to somehow, you know, become the best game manager uh, that I could, that I could be. Uh, and so that's where Mike came in again and he had started ABD in the late nineties, uh, early, you know, two thousands. And so I called him and I said, Hey, send me anywhere, send me, you know, across the country, send me wherever you need to send me. I said, I don't care what you pay me. I want to coach as many games as I can possibly coach. And so did you, did you think that, I mean, prior to that, cause I, I, I'm, you know, young coaches are going to watch this. They always get to, Hey, what did, did you always know you wanted to be a coach? I mean, was no. it? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the plan, you know, I was a, an econ, you know, political science, double major. And, and the plan was, you know, I was thinking about being an attorney and, uh, the the athletic director at the high school I was from and Rich Emmerd both uh, as I was graduating I showed up to one of my brother's uh, baseball games uh, who was playing for him at the time and uh, they talked me into it you know they said we'll help you with your student teaching we'll help you with this we'll cover this and you know coming out of college without a job and the and the prospects of more you know student loans and things like that you know, going to grad school, I was like, yeah, I was like, give it a shot. You know, why not? And John, you're smarter. You're smarter than to be a darn coach. Man. That's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, long story short, we're, you know, what is it now? Almost 30 years in, um, you know, it was, it was a good decision because it's provided, you know, a good life. It's provided the opportunity for me to be a father, uh, you know, to my boys and, and, you know, looking back now, they're both, my youngest is graduating this year. Um, that's the best, you know, role or anything that I've ever, it's the best thing I've ever been a part of, you know, is raising those two boys. And, uh, you know, so looking back, you know, I, you know, I thank those two, I thank Rich all the time, you know, for, yeah. for pulling me in and, and, you know, realistically, uh, CBA is simply an extension of the networks that he and Mike built and, and essentially handed us, you know, at a, at a young yeah. age. And so yeah. without those two guys, you know, we're not, we're not here. Well, the, the other thank you needs to be the guy that told you you weren't good enough to play anymore than started yeah. <laughs> catapulting yeah. you on the, uh, well, the funny, thing is, the, the funny thing is, is, is he's a, he's a prominent division one coach right now. 
and uh, he uh, he moved back to California recently uh, to coach on the on the West Coast. And uh, I was the first person he called, and uh, he didn't remember. And I spelled it out for him. I said, "Hey, man," I said, "Did you, you know, why why are you calling me? Because?" And I, you know, spelled it out for him. And uh, we hugged it out and had a good chat, and uh, it was it was it ended positive. What, you know? what, what's that old saying? It, it isn't personal; it's just personnel. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. there was something there was something in your answer that I think is really interesting because, you know, this is about you, but very similar. You know, I was playing and got real, you know shut it down with the Cubs in '91, and got and that kind of thrusted me into coaching at a young age. And so, what I wanted to ask you. That's why I asked you about the age at which you started coaching. Because, again, there's probably a lot of young coaches out there. Did you find it difficult at 21, um, like that, that line between, the, you know, you're just right out of playing. Those guys probably aren't a lot younger than you. Like, what were some of the challenges or things on that? Do you remember that at all or no? Yeah, no, effective communication. You know, uh, effective communication was, was definitely a, uh, a limiter or a barrier, you know, whatever you want to call it, because, you know, I didn't, as, as a young coach, I didn't, you know, know how to speak to younger players in a way that it would be received as advice or as something that they would, you know, want to make their own where, you know, 25 years down the road, 30 years down the road, you know, it's, it's become second nature, you know, as a teacher now and everything. But that was, that was the biggest part, you know, and, and learning that, uh, you know, <laughs> making kids run and punitive discipline isn't always the, uh, the greatest answer to every problem, you know, days gone by, man. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Ain't, ain't that the truth? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and that kind of even leads me to, you know, and, and why I told you again, I love doing these types of interviews because get to know, you know, you guys better and, and the start of it. But the one thing that I think has stood out for me in the diamond allegiance and your membership and your focus of your organization is development. Like you guys are keen, keen, keen on development and the So what, what, what is that? Why is that? And you particular, and you know, I always joke you and Eric package, who's our mad scientist on this end. Uh, I think you guys could talk for days on this stuff. So how did that get, you know, how'd you get so locked in to the development? And then, you know, even on that question dovetailing that stuff's ever changing. And, and it seems to be that you're always wanting to be on the forefront of that on development. So why is that? Um, well, I think that that stems primarily, you know, from from Mike and the roots that that we kind of, I, I guess, grew up in in this. And the practices were always the most important. Uh, the practices, the workouts, monitoring and managing, you know, a player's individual development uh, over wins, over tournament, anything. I mean, those are nice and stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have one, you're not going to have the other. And, and so when we set this up, development was the most important thing. And so our, our entire structure uh, is built on development and it's tiered in a way that, you know, it incentivizes kids to, you know, go out and do a little more and work a little harder. And as they move up the rungs in the organization, you know, that development's rewarded. And so you can't just roll in, you know, as a, you know, accomplished, committed kid and not, make it through those rungs like we we you know we don't we don't necessarily recruit anymore we don't you know do any of that stuff because we know that the game is changing we know that you know the the younger players today are changing and their expectations are a little different than they were even 10 years ago yep. um, and so you know as long as we stay true you know to the structure and the format that we, that we have uh, we've got a couple guys you know in the organization that do a really really good job uh, with that, you know, Joe Spears, Mike's son, uh, has a facility uh, in the Inland Empire that stresses development, you know, through all kinds of, you know, speed development, Proteus motion, all kinds of stuff that he has that, you know, our entire program accesses. Uh, and so for us, you know, that's, that's the most important piece is at the end of the day, you know, this player that showed up at, at 15 is the bigger, faster, stronger, better, you know, more, you know, emotionally stable. Uh, than when he showed up. Uh, and, and so if we can say yes, then obviously, you know, we did our job as an organization. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the other thing that just talking about that, what have you seen in your time? Because I, I have my own opinions on this, but like the you know, on the receiving end of getting guys to come through travel ball and the, on development, 
where does competition fit in all of this for you in the model? In other words, you know, I get a guy, he's like, Hey coach, how's my arm look? Or, you know, where should I be delivered? I'm like, Hey man, get him out. Like, isn't that the idea? Like, so what's the balance as you guys try to do in CBA between the competitive piece versus the development for the individual kid? Uh, one fuels the other, you know, um, you know, you have to be, and so in practices, you know, we try and make everything as competitive as possible and, you know, not unforgiving to where, you know, a kid that's physically behind the curve, you know, is going to get swallowed a little bit. We, we Good choice of word, by the way, right there. Curve. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we, yeah, I don't know. Shameless plug. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we try and make everything competitive. Uh, we try and make it, you know, where, where we set the standard super, super high in practice. And it's almost, it's almost impossible to me. Right. And so then through that, you're going to have kids striving and striving, you know, to not only meet those standards, but also move up, you know, the rungs in the organization. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, to kind of answer that a little further, the one thing that's changed the most uh, for us is strength development. Um, you know, when they changed the bats, you know, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, whatever it was, it changed everything, you know, no longer, you know, could an average strength kid swing a bat, even in a high school game, you know, and hit for any power or anything like that. Yeah. Now you see the change in the college game. You see the change all over the place. I mean, some guy that player in professional baseball hit a ball at 119, you know, the other day, that's absurd. Um, and so for us, you know, especially for the players in the upper rungs of the organization, if you're not a different and better athlete every three months, you're not doing your job, you know, yep. as a young player, you have to be bigger, faster, stronger in, in some way, shape or form every three months. And, you know, and we try and stress that as much as possible. You know, we, we do lose some players, you know, because of that. Um, but, you know, if those aren't the players we because of uh, what just not the appetite for putting yeah, the work like, or yeah what? like i don't need to wait lift why do i need to do that you know why is that important for baseball you know and you, you run into you know a lot of parents that have the the belief that you know weightlifting is still i mean i remember this 20 years ago you know weightlifting is not for baseball players um and so I, still, I was playing at the time it was just coming in so i know exactly yeah and so you still have you know a little bit of that but i think for the most part you know people are beginning to embrace it more and more so, and this kind of hit me as we were talking. Well, two things we said to Mecula, it's a good baseball and good wine, right? I mean, yes. yeah. yeah, you got to have some good wine there. Yeah. So you see, you, on the high school level, you've seen it. And this kind of leads me to the travel ball thing. Like, I, get the, I would get the question a lot as a, as a college coach of, hey, you know, do I need to do the travel ball to be recruited? Um, you know, and I, and again, I, I'll let you speak to, I have my own answers on that, but like, what do you see as like one of the main benefits or differences or whatever between the high school stuff and the travel ball? I think playing for somebody else, um, is beneficial, you know, getting different views and, and ideas on things, uh, being a high school teacher myself, uh, I know that, you know, not every high school program has a baseball minded person running the program it's really hard you know to find an english teacher who also does baseball or you know whatever kind of teacher who does baseball so you're seeing kind of the evolution of the high school game changing with walk-on coaches you know and they don't they don't last very long um you know due to the you know work requirements and things outside of uh that program um you know for us it's rubbing elbows with with different players right you bring in you know, a player from the Inland Empire versus a player from San Diego. And, you know, the competitive spirit, I think, uh, of better players being around each other creates an even better environment, you know. And so for us, you know, we want our kids, you know, to, to get along and, and prioritize being a teammate before an individual. That's a huge piece of what we do. And then taking that back to their high school program, because if you're, you know, if you're a leader in your high school program, you know, and you have, you know, eight other players who may not be as talented as you that don't play travel ball or whatever, I don't think your interactions with them are going to be the same as the interactions with your teammates on your club team. And so you learn those skills, how to be a leader, how to talk to people, you know, how to motivate your peers without being overbearing. And you take that back 
to your high school team. And, and I mean, that's just a life skill. That's not so much, you know, right. always a baseball skill. That's a life skill. Um, you know, and, and I've learned a lot, especially, you know, watching my own sons go through, you know, baseball themselves, go through high school and club and, and now into college. Um, you know, I've learned a lot, you know, on, on, you know, how to speak to players and how to, how to, how to do things in, in a, in a better way and how to reach, uh, kids a little differently. And that's what we want, you know, our players to do, you know, inside the club environment. And so, you know, for us, it, it's teaching them those things along with baseball to bring back to their high school team. And in a perfect world, um, the high school coach, like we have high school coaches that send us their players just for that. Um, and so in a perfect world, it absolutely works. Um, to, to send, send them there to bring a little bit of the, what you, like the CBA training or whatever. You yeah. Know, back the into the training, the confidence building. I mean, cause at the end of the day, our job is to make these kids feel like Superman. Right. So they can they can stand in the box or stand on the mound and, and conquer anything. And so yeah. we won't always have the most talented kids, but I guarantee you we're going to have the most confident kids, um, you know, knowing that they can tackle anything, anytime. Yeah, it's funny. I was I, I was having dinner actually with uh, a family of the CBA um, in, in Vegas. And it was just interesting to me because you know, when we talk about like the brand of CBA. You guys are expanding. You, you've got a name in the industry. And. I say this all the time on his interviews, like, look, I'm no expert in the travel ball space, but I'm learning. And it's just interesting how much your brand CBA comes, uh, comes up across, not just where you are locally, but, but out there. And um, I, I'd kind of said, you know, why, why'd you play for them? And it was just interesting about what CBA meant to them. So I guess I would ask you, like, if someone's watching this, from another part of the country where CBA is not in there. What, like, what is, what does CBA mean to you or should mean to you of a kid out there of the, of the CBA brand, if you will, what does it mean? Um, well, you're coming into a family, you're coming into a group of guys that, you know, had no intention of, uh, of doing anything like this ever. And <laughs> it, it ended up, you know, falling together and we did it because we had each other's back. We did it because, you know, unfortunately we had, you know, some circumstances in, in 2013 that forced this, but you're walking into a family of people that get along, that, that get along as, as friends, that get along as, as brothers. And that's the kind of environment we want all of our teams uh, to embody and, and to have. Um, and so not only are you gonna get, you know, a, a different view on baseball, like a more aggressive, more um, free view of playing the game, much more so than other places and probably even, you know, their high school team. Um, but you're walking into an environment that, you know, these people that are going to help you with the game, not only are going to help you with the game, but they're going to have your back for the rest of your life. Um, yep. You know, that's, you know, for us, that was, you know, the intent, you know, build, develop, and make sure these kids know that they got a home, you know, forever. You said it earlier, you know, it's funny, I, same thing in coaching, like, we're so fortunate to have this, little, it's almost like a little laboratory for our players to be able to grow. And it's, it's so much greater than baseball, you know, because they are going to be, you know, family people, they're going to probably run their own businesses and do different things. And um, the fact that we get to educate and teach and use the baseball field as the lab, if you will, uh, is, is actually rewarding as heck. So what, what's probably one of the best success stories of maybe a kid that's come through the program or whatever that you get that random text, call, letter, email saying, hey, man, I appreciate it. Even if it, even if it wasn't good at the time. Uh, well, yeah, recently, uh, Luke Williams. Uh, Luke Williams uh, was a high school player, graduated 2015 uh, out of Aliso Niguel. And we couldn't get a college to take him. Like we couldn't. He was on a team that year, you know, Chris Betts was behind the plate, you know, Nick Madrigal played short, you know, we had just, I mean, Peter Lambert's in the big leagues as a pitcher, Bailey Falters in the big leagues as a pitcher. I mean, this team is ridiculous, right? And so we couldn't get anybody to take him. And so Joe and I and Josh Glassy are standing there watching a game in Arizona. Luke gets a base hit and the way he rounded first base, we all looked at each other and Joe goes, he's going to be a big leaguer. 
And I'm like, Joe, we can't even get a college to take him. I was like, how's this going, you know? And so sure enough, uh, as we get into January of his senior year, I call his dad and I said, hey, I said, I think it's time to get an advisor. I said, there's just so much buzz. And he's like, what are you talking about? He just committed to, you know, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He's, it took us this long to get a college. What are you talking about? So he ends up being a fourth rounder uh, and signs. And uh, I still have the message on my cell phone. I'm not going to, I will never delete it. Uh, he called uh, the day he uh, got called up and uh, we called each other and, and, you know, talked about it, you know, cried it out a little bit, uh, but, uh, you know, taking a kid like that, who, at, you know, when he was a freshman, he was, you know, five, seven, five, eight, maybe 130 pounds behind the curve a little bit. There you go. Um, and turned into played some football and baseball in high school and just grew into, you know, this unbelievable athlete, you know, that as a senior, nobody wanted to take a chance on. And he continued to bet on himself and continued to bet on himself. And the confidence was through the roof. And now he's having the time of his life, played on the Phillies last year, traded to the Giants. And he's loving life, doing it, living the dream. Yeah. Talk about, yeah, I don't know who the hell those guys were at Arizona State that wouldn't take him at that time. But I, you know, I have no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how many times I hear that? You know, it's, but that's, but that's the beauty, I think, of our sport is the maturation pace. And when you say, man, when guys get a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, but they don't, they don't blame, they sit around and keep working hard. And, and if it's the motivation of, hey, man, I'm going to prove everybody wrong or I'm just going to keep being me, but those are the stories that are awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I don't know who the hell those guys were at Arizona State didn't dig into that. So, uh, so I always like this question too. This is one of those tough ones where, uh, but like we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but everything you know now and you've seen in the industry or whatever, what would you tell that, that 21 year old, you know, John Pano that started out way back when that maybe would have helped him uh, dodge some potholes or, some hurdles that maybe could have shortened the learning curve. There's that curve thing again, yeah, shortened yeah. that learning curve a little bit. So what would you, what would you tell that John, that young 21 year old John Pano? That you know uh, I tell, yeah, man, I tell him a couple of things. I tell him one, not everybody's your enemy. Um, you know, cause I think that's something that we do when someone's across the field, not everybody's your enemy. Um, and then uh, also build relationships before the X's and O's build relationships before you know, looking at whether a kid can hit or field or, or any of that um, is what I've learned, you know, more so in the last five to six years is one will fuel the other. You build the relationship, you build the confidence. It'll take care of most times it'll take care of the on the field stuff, um, yeah. you know? And so, you know, as a coach now, you know, that's, that's first and foremost, um, yeah. is I want to earn the trust of that young man, you know, before I do anything, you know? And so I guess that would be the most, most important. Well, it's too, it's obviously to your core because you weaved, um, you weaved that in one fuels the other multiple times in our short conversation here, that it's not just this, it's, it's, it's all, it's all process. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, and so the crystal ball question. So where do you see three to five, 10, whatever, where do you see yourself in this? And, and it could be, you know, whatever, life, business, whatever, baseball, not baseball. And then kind of where do you see, you know, your organization going and as you guys grow um, in the next three to five years? So we'll, we'll start with, you know, where's John Pano in the crystal ball world? Uh, well, I plan to retire from teaching here in uh, six years. Uh, take take my minimum and uh, gone. Um, you know things are things are changing fast. Um, schools are changing fast, and uh, I don't feel like I'm a dinosaur. But when I sit in meetings, I feel like I feel like you know um, yeah. I'm gonna do something else. I don't know what it is. I'm gonna continue doing the baseball, but I'm gonna incorporate something else. I don't know what that is yet. I got six years to figure it out. Um, you know, and at 55, you know, I don't feel like I'm too old to to venture into to something new. I don't know. Maybe I'll work in a bike shop. You know, I love cycling. So maybe I'll work on a bike. Do shop. you really? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, I was funny. I was, I was walking with somebody just yesterday, we were walking by a fitness thing or whatever. And 
he's showing me the different things. He said, Oh, there's the spin room. I'm like, dude, there's one thing I hate in life. It's cycling. <laughs> <laughs> so I know. Oh, dude, hey. What's the interest in that? How'd you get started in that? Sorry, the uh, sidebar, but that's interesting. Yeah, no, man. No, we, uh, when I first got into teaching and I was done playing, you know, I, I felt like just a piece of garbage. And the athletic director that roped me into this whole thing was racing mountain bikes at the time. And uh, I went out for a couple of rides with them, got a bike and uh, raced as a professional from 2000 to 2003. And what? yeah, yeah. While I was coaching and teaching and the whole thing. And, um, and so I got to do some pretty crazy stuff. Got to go you know, to Canada and all kinds of other places riding a bike. Uh, so my well, youngest son so you, bikes now and yeah you know ben greenspan right my, yeah you know yeah. so ben that's his passion's cycling well he dude you he know, looks he, like it he's got the, the long slender yeah he he loves it he tried to get me to do it and i'm like i can't and his dad i worked for when he was the ad at, at indiana and, and rick would kill me if i'm you know this this might be the part where they edit out but his dad rick <laughs> yeah. greenspan he was he was a little on the larger side shall we say and I just saw it. So his dad got into cycling with, with Ben or I don't know, vice versa, but he's eaten up with it now. I just saw a picture of him last week. I didn't recognize him. Like, like his lost. I can't believe what he looked like. So yeah. no, it is healthy. Uh, it's a fountain of youth, man. It's nature scrub rush. It's beautiful. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, Barry, and Barry Bonds is big into it, right? Is cycling. he now? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, he came back, spoke to our team, and that's like his passion right now. Is he bikes all the cycles all the time competitively, yeah. and so your son does it. So you pass the torch on to him. Yeah, my younger son, he uh, he sat me down in seventh grade, and he's afraid I was going to kill him, and he told me he didn't want to play baseball anymore. And uh, I was like, all right, and he, you know, now I actually you know thank him for making that decision because we've shared just awesome times on the bike together. And uh, just watching him go through this last year of his high school racing career, it's been it's been fun. So that's a thing. Uh, this is how ignorant. So what, what's the what's the competitive world in in high school with the cycling, or just in he does it outside the high school setting? No, it's a part of uh, it's a club that high schools have. Uh, pretty much every high school now in California has one. Uh, okay. There are four levels, and you have to earn your way through the four levels when you start as a freshman. And uh, he got to the highest in California, finished second in uh, California this year through the whole series. Um, and so it's been it's been fun watching the, this, the evolution of of him as a person, you know, through the sport, because he started as this little meatball, you know, as a freshman, you know, developmentally way behind everybody and yeah. then uh, ended up catching him and, you know, doing really, really well. So, and that's kind of the segue in the next. So, I guess we're going to see a CBA cycling. Uh, cycling I wish. Uh, I wish. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. The Get out ahead of that thing. Stand for, but yeah. So, the crystal ball for CBA in the next three, five, ten. Yeah. Months. Just keep going, you know. I mean, we, uh, you know, we see a lot of teams expanding, you know, and, and, and plopping satellite groups everywhere. I don't, we've never done that. We do. Now, I say this, you know, let me preface this. The only time we do it is if it's a fit, if it's a fit with the group of people that we have. If you're a like-minded person and you have the same values and the same everything, we'll do it. Um, but it has to be underneath the same structure. You know, we got a lot of rules. You know, we, we a lot of kids choose not to play with us because we, we've got rules. Um, the way you wear your pants, the way you wear your eye black, the way, you know, you basically, you know, everything you do from the time you walk from the car, to the field and back, there's some guiding something that, that yep. is going to help you become a better player, going to help you become a more responsible person. And uh, we're finding today that both parents and players don't necessarily want to embrace, you know, all of that guidance. Uh, and so, you know, we've recently kind of relaxed, you know, our, our hair policy. You know, we were pretty, pretty militant. I was the same. Yeah, we were pretty militant on the uh, on the hair. And so now we're just going above the collar, um, you know, just keep it, you know, somewhat tidy. Uh, and, and so, you know, I don't want to say that we're, we're compromising here. We're trying to work with people. You're evolving. You're evolving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and so I think now, at, at, you know, 30 years in, I have more suggestions than we do uh, hardline rules. 
Um, I kind of took that from John Wooden, you know, after watching all of his stuff. I, I was, you know, what, when you started down that path, I was going to be, I was got, I was literally going to say, you got a little, a little of the John Wooden stuff in here. It sounds <laughs> yeah. like. Well, it's, it's true. You know, and the more that I listen to a lot of those older, you know, coaches talk in their, in their latter days of their career, I'm like, man, now I get it. You know, whereas a younger guy, I was like, what are they doing? Compromise is ridiculous. You know, and now I'm like, man, I get it. You know? Well, it, it was my father-in-law was a longtime AD coach actually got me started, but he would always say, you know, kids want discipline. You know, they want to feel like they're part of something special. And, and while they may complain about some of those rules and things that you have right now, it still gives them a little bit of something to be like, Hey man, we're different. We, you know, we do this a certain way. So I, I love it. That's, but yeah, you got to so, evolve. True. No, absolutely. Um, you know, and for us, I think, the more we infuse and the more we get better across the program in the different areas we're in, because obviously, you know, Southern California is a pretty large area. Um, and so the more we put resources like Joe's facility and things like that in every area that we have to make sure the development is, is consistent and the same, you know, and not to throw a shameless plug in for the curve app, but that's what we're hoping, you know, yeah. the curve app can incentivize is that kind of development across the program and not where, you know, a kid in San Diego is getting a different product than, you know, a kid in Long Beach. We want them to have the same product and the same opportunities. Yeah. Well, it's kind of leads. Again, yeah, you're, you're right on the last. So why, why, what was, why, why the diamond allegiance? why did you decide to, to be a big part of this? And again, I, I know from our, from our side of it, we're thrilled to, you know, have a group, uh, not only you and your people you bring to it, the CBA, as I've already said, means something to a lot of people around the country. But why did you decide to do it? The people, uh, the people involved. Um, you know, there there are a handful of people, you know, that over the years that I've developed relationships with that that I trust, um, you know, that I trust with, with anything. Um, and Eric Backage, you know, is one of those people. And, you know, I've known Matt, you know, for a long time and had some knockdown drag out, you know, games with, uh, with him and he's a character, you know, he's always been a character, always going to be a character. Uh, and, you know, and I, I'm drawn to, you know, passionate people like that. You know, I've always, you know, I, I've always been that way, you know, go talk to that guy just to talk to him because he's so passionate about what he does like Petty, you know, I love talking to Petty and just, and, and just giving him so much grief. You know, and he, he stands in and he takes it, you know, and um, we were in an elevator like four years ago. I used to stay at the same hotel with him on purpose in uh, Jupiter just to mess with him. <laughs> and, you know, we're in the elevator and, you know, you probably want to, you know, edit this part out. But uh, he, he looks at me and he goes, man, he goes, all you do is talk shit. <laughs> And he said it in fun, like he said it, you know, with a smile. Oh yeah. And he, goes, and he looks at me and goes, "And your kids, man." He goes, "I can't beat you." He goes, "But your kids, all they do is talk shit and have fun." He goes, "It drives me crazy," you know. And and yeah. you know, the more that you know, I can learn, you know, from Jeff and the way he runs his business and the way he, you know, and the same with Matt. You know, it was it was the people, you know. And so the yeah. first three calls I got, I got Petty, Gerber, and uh, and Backage. You know, and those are three people that I have a ton of respect for. And I was like, well, you know what? If these three guys are in, I'm stupid not to. And yeah. wherever it takes us, you know what? I'm going to go all in and, and two feet in and, and we're going to make it work as much as we can. Because if those types of people are behind it, it, can, it can't not be successful. Yeah.